Welcome to Lesson 1b, Vector Notation and Summation Convention. In this lesson, we'll discuss expanded vector notation and unit vectors. I'll also introduce the summation convention, which leads us to tensor or indicial notation. I'll discuss two different kinds of Cartesian tensor notation, and we'll apply these concepts to second-order tensors. First, let's consider these for vectors. The velocity vector, for example, we're used to writing as uvw, but as I said in the previous lesson, we'll get used to writing this as u1, u2, u3, which we define at some x location, x1, x2, x3. Formally, we expand it in vector notation by writing this, u vector is u1, i, where i is the unit vector in the x direction, plus u2j, plus u3k. But in keeping with our convention of indices, it's better to write it this way, u equal u1, e1 vector, plus u2, e2 vector, plus u3, e3 vector, where we have replaced i, j, k by e1, e2, and e3, where these are now our unit vectors. Expanded out, e1 is just 1, 0, 0. Likewise, e2 is 0, 1, 0, and e3 is 0, 0, 1. These are all in Cartesian coordinates, by the way. We'll get used to using these as our unit vectors instead of i, j, k. One caution here. When we write a vector like the velocity vector as u1, u2, u3, these subscripts represent the three components of the vector. But for unit vectors, these subscripts do not represent the three components. Rather, they reference the three coordinate axes. In other words, these are not components of a vector. These unit vectors are vectors themselves given by these three components of each one. That's how we interpret this equation, which I'll rewrite here. This component is a scalar, while this unit vector is a vector. When we add up these three vectors, we get a vector. Another way to write this in shorthand is to write u equals summation i equal 1 to 3 of ui ei vector. These mean the same thing. Now I'll introduce the summation convention, namely any time an index is repeated, for example, index i appears twice, it implies summation over that index. So we write this equation as u equal ui ei vector. Summation is implied. From now on, when you see two indices that are repeated, in your mind you should be thinking sigma 1 to 3. This summation convention was invented by Albert Einstein. I am glad to hear that my summation convention is still being used. Thank you, Albert. We appreciate you. Danke. There are various names for this summation convention. Cartesian tensor notation is probably the most formal name, which a lot of people just call tensor notation. Other people call it index notation, indicial notation, Cartesian notation, or Einsteinian notation in honor of its inventor. This is the one I'll most often use, but you may find me naming one of these other ones occasionally. Now let me introduce what I call proper or formal Cartesian tensor notation. We would write vector u as ui ei, where ui represents the three components of u, and the ei vectors represent the three unit vectors. As I said in the previous lesson, if we rotate the axes, the directions of these change, and therefore the components change, but u itself does not. u is a physical velocity that does not depend on which axes we choose. Now we'll get even simpler, what I call simplified Cartesian tensor notation, where we write simply ui. This i is called a free index, since it's not repeated. So free index i implies i equal 1, 2, or 3. When you see u sub i, in your mind you should be thinking that these are the three components, 1, 2, or 3. In other words, ui implies either u1, u2, or u3, the components of u. Extending this idea, we can also write u equal u e u, where u is the magnitude of vector u, which we represent as the absolute value of vector u, and e u vector is the unit vector in the direction of u. I sketch that here. This is sometimes useful, but I won't use it that often. Finally, it is not proper to write u vector equal u i, where we're mixing up vector and tensor notation. It is proper to write u vector equal u i e i vector, which we like to simplify to just u i and avoid having to write the ei unit vectors all the time. The way I will handle it when I want to go from vector to tensor notation is to write u vector implies ui, or vice versa, where the arrow means implies. That way we're not writing something mathematically improper. 
The bottom line is that when you see a UI, you think of it automatically in your mind as the three components of this vector U. Now let's apply these concepts to second order tensors. In proper Cartesian tensor notation, we'll write our stress tensor T with two arrows as Tij EI vector EJ vector, where Tij represents the components of the stress tensor in this Cartesian coordinate system. But what is this product of these two unit vectors? It's not a dot product. These are just two unit vectors multiplied together. Mathematicians call this a dyad, or a dyadic product. What does this mean? This dyadic product represents two directions for each component of the second order tensor. One of these represents the surface that we choose, and the other represents, in this case, of a stress tensor, the force per unit area on that surface in the specified direction. Tij itself, in tensor notation, can be written like a matrix. The first row is T11, T12, T13. The second row is T21, T22, and T23, and then T31, T32, and T33. Here's where tensor notation starts to be very convenient and useful. Using my arrow for implies, we can say that T double arrow implies Tij, and Tij implies T double vector. Since there are two indices, we recognize this as a second order tensor. When we write Tij, this way, we think of it in our mind as one of these nine components, depending on our choice of i and j. Whereas we call this proper Cartesian tensor notation, I like to call the simplified tensor notation version when we just write Tij. Notice up here that both i and j are repeated, which by convention means they are summed. So in our minds, we remember that this means we sum over both i and j. So we write this as T11 E1 E1 plus T12 E1 E2 plus T13 E1 E3 plus T21 E2 E1, etc., making sure we keep all our indices straight. Notice that I put these in the same order as we commonly write the matrix. That applies both to the component of the tensor and the unit vectors. Compare, for example, this row with this row. Each of these unit vector products is a dyad or a dyadic product. This first row represents keeping i equal 1 and summing j, and then this second row is keeping i equal 2 and summing j, and then keeping i equal 3 and summing j. But what do these directions actually mean? Well, the index convention for Tij is that the first index, here the i, is the direction of the surface normal, and the second index, here the j, is the direction of the tensor component. So when we write Tij, it means the j component of stress acting on a surface whose outward normal is in the i direction. That's how we interpret this index convention. And then in Cartesian coordinates, we simply define the stress tensor by its components. Let's take, for example, a fluid element and consider this face whose outward normal is in the x1 direction. By our convention, T11 would be the component in the x1 direction acting on a surface whose outward normal is also in the x1 direction. I'll write this out formally. T11 is the component in the x1 direction acting on a surface whose outward normal is in the x1 direction, where the first index indicates the direction of the outward normal, and the second index represents the component of the actual stress on that surface. Similarly, we define T12 as the component in the x2 direction, the two coming from this second index, acting on a surface whose outward normal is in the x1 direction. Finally, T13 on this surface is the component in the x3 direction, again the 3 coming from this second index, the x3 direction, acting on a surface whose outward normal is in the x1 direction. As this fluid particle shrinks to a point, and recall that we define vectors and tensors at a point in the flow, the components on the opposite side of the element must be equal and opposite. What we're saying is that this component on the other side of the fluid element, which is now just a point, has to be equal in magnitude but opposite in direction. That is true not just for this normal component, but also for the tangential components, T13 and T23. This is simply an expression of Newton's third law, since for the stress tensor, we're talking about forces per unit area. On this opposite face to the one we talked about, our unit vector points the other way. I would draw my three stresses as equal and opposite. T11 is the normal one, T13 acts that way, and T12 acts that way, where the magnitudes must be the same, 
but the directions are opposite. In terms of our explanation here, this is still valid, but since the surface is acting in a direction opposite to the axes, the component is also opposite in direction compared to the other face. This tensor notation is what we'll use throughout the rest of these lessons. Thank you for watching this video. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel for more videos.